Welcome to the Muddy Waters podcast and YouTube series. And this is by far and away the most deeply personal episode I'll likely ever do or have done. And as the title might suggest, it's about divorce. And I titled this episode Divorce Wars quite intentionally. In 2001 began an over three and a half year divorce battle that I personally experienced. So I am one of those 42 to 43 percent of all U.S. marriages that end in divorce. And I'm going to tell you firsthand some of the experiences that I gained knowledge from since that experience ended around 2004, 2005. I've counseled countless other people, not in legal advice, because let me be very clear, I am not an attorney and this is not meant to be legal advice. It is instead to level set on expectations, to really share with you firsthand what the family court experience is. And I will say to you this, if you are one of those 42 or 43 percent, or someone you know or care about may become one of those 42 or 43 percent, this is a very, very important episode to tune into or to share with others. I also want to say my heart goes out to you. It can be devastating emotionally and certainly is when a marriage ends. All that promise that you saw on the day you exchanged vows, for that to just shift through your hands like sand at the beach can be heartbreaking. But it's important that you not turn that disappointment emotion into an anger emotion. Because frankly speaking, it can cost you everything. So. Again, this is not legal advice. It's not meant to be legal advice. I am not an attorney. I'm not advising you what to do. I'm simply going to share things from an awareness perspective that if you or someone you know may be facing divorce in the future, it is very, very important to me that you hear this experience, that you learn from the mistakes and the successes of others navigating this very challenging and emotionally devastating, financially potentially devastating space, and just take away the things that you can do to better protect you, if there are children involved, certainly to, to act in the best interest of those children, to create a healthy environment where both you and your spouse can co-parent into the future and really raise, you know, adults that are going to be successful in life and well-adjusted and balanced emotionally, mentally, physically. Um, so that is why I'm recording this episode. I appreciate you tuning in. And we're going to start with the basis for divorce. When a divorce between spouses occurs, there are multiple potential grounds that can be claimed. Infidelity, irreconcilable differences, uh, substance abuse challenges, financial challenges. There are just a number of things that can be the cause that is presented to the court to say this marriage needs to be broken and here are the reasons why. But what's important to know is when it involves children, and I'm going to speak from my experience in the state of California, the state of California has a belief which I support and I fully embrace that the decisions they make should be in the best interest of the children and the prevailing opinion in the state of California and, you know, probably most states around the country as well, the prevailing opinion is that it's in the best interest of the children to have significant relationships with both parents. And that leads to the state of California and many other states defaulting to a 50-50 parenting plan. And what they look for is alternating weeks or perhaps there's four days on, three days off rotation between the parents such that each parent gets equal time with their children. Think about from a developmental perspective how important that can be for children, right? Um, to be able to see each parent now on their own as opposed to perhaps the dysfunction, the arguments that they saw within a uh, household, seeing them on their own, starting a new life, and beginning to, to have their legs underneath them, beginning to, you know, show signs of a social life and be successful on their own, 
and spend one-on-one -on -one time with children that perhaps they didn't have because of the dynamics between spouses. So it makes sense that 50-50, wherever possible, would be you know, the preference of the court. It certainly was in the experience I and many of the folks that I've counseled have had. However, it's important to note that there is a financial component to this best interest of the children decision. And whenever a spouse is after the money, I don't know how else to say it, could be the father, could be, you know, the mother, could be however that dynamic is, there has to be a basis to change that best interest of the child 50-50 um, court opinion. And that basis, very simply, is one of abuse. It is mental, it is physical, um, and unless that can be proved in court, then it's likely the court's going to default to 50-50. So I want you to keep that in mind in the context of all the other things we're going to talk about today, because it is a very important factor to be aware of. Secondarily, it's very important to understand, you know, in my situation, I was the breadwinner. I was the W-2 earner. I had a very successful sales and sales management career. And during the marriage, you know, my former wife had a love for horses. And we agreed that, hey, I'm going to go out and work five, six days a week. You can be home with the children, and it's important to us to raise them correctly. And you can, you know, uh, build your horse business as kind of a cash business and something to do. And you can enjoy your life because I'm going to take on the burden of earning. It is critical for you to understand that while, in your opinion, you were the provider, whether you're the husband or the wife in the marriage, you're the provider providing for the other to be home with the children. There is a waiting for who was the primary caregiver in the equation of the best interest of the children. And if you were gone... 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the time working, then the court may weigh in the favor of the primary caregiver. I mention this because it was never my intention not to be there for my children. And I'm sure if you were the primary breadwinner in your household, it was a shared decision and something that you felt some honor in doing for your family. But you need to have that parenting time especially when there are signs of a potential problem within your marriage. You need to have that parenting time to keep your children okay. That's the primary driver to this. But the secondary driver is if you're away most of the time and your spouse is the primary caregiver, they are the emotional support system for your children, and the court's going to weigh that into their equation. So again, I want to emphasize this. We're going to talk about the financial implications of divorce. I am not taking away at all from the pain, the emotional suffering, the devastation that can occur in people's lives when, you know, this ship hits the iceberg. That's not the intent of this. I want you to think about it in a different way instead. If you lose every asset that you built within the marriage, what kind of a life can you provide for your children? Yeah, you want to be there emotionally for them. You want to um, support them in their educational efforts, their you know, sports-related efforts, all those other things. But if you don't have money to put in the gas tank, how are you going to be there for your children? It is critical to protect the assets in the way that best serves the family as it spreads itself apart. And that's really why I'm having this conversation with you. So before we go any further into this exploration... I want to give you some very, very important advice for either you or someone you may know or care about who could be facing a divorce situation, especially with children. Sit down. Have conversations. Be reasonable. Reasonable. And I'll emphasize this later when we talk about mediation that occurs in family court services. Be reasonable in your conversations. Be realistic about outcomes. 
do not let the emotion of anger and disappointment, do not let those emotions drive your behaviors, drive rage. Because you know what? That will come back to haunt you. And if you can sit down and have a meaningful conversation with your spouse about really where you're at in your marriage and how this may change into the future and how to best set both of you up for success, you're going to get a very good sense of the potential battle to come or perhaps a way to avoid that potential battle. So we're next going to dive into the mechanics of the family court system and how this whole thing transpires. But what I first want to say to you is really a statement of warning. In family court services, which is where divorces go to when they're disputed, there is really no such thing as perjury because it's so difficult to prove. Family court is about he said, she said, with some witnesses that may sign statements. But frankly speaking, the court in its wisdom and in its discretion assumes that there are going to be a tremendous amount of opportunities to finger point at one another. And so they tend to discount things unless they are egregious. They tend to discount things that you may say about your spouse or your spouse may say about you. Well, he was physically abusive or she was emotionally unavailable. Yeah, those are things you can say. Um, but how do you prove those things? You might bring in witness statements. But the court doesn't know if that witness statement was coerced by you and produced by a dear friend of yours who would do anything to help you and knows you're in a divorce and you twisted their arm and begged them and cried or whatever you might have done. The court assumes that all those things may be the case. They weigh heavily on interviews with your children, interviews with you, as opposed to the statements that you may make about behaviors. But the reason that I raise all this topic is I want to get back to that um, statement I made about abuse. And sadly and unfortunately, if your spouse has now decided that the marriage is broken and they're in it for how to best set themselves up for the future, many attorneys may advise them and you know, before I say anything more that might disparage attorneys, there are so many honorable uh, attorneys out there that give great advice. But as it relates to those who may not, you know, if you claim mental physical abuse, um, that is a basis for changing that best interest of the child equation from 50-50. Now realize that it has to stand up in court, but it can be an initial attempt and an initial foray. I'll never forget during my divorce, I read a book by the attorney uh, Barry Pistotnik, and it was called, coincidentally, Divorce Wars. And it laid out exactly how this abuse strategy can work and how it can work in the favor of a spouse. So I want to, again, plant that seed with you because now we're going to talk about the basis for an initial hearing, and we're going to talk about what comes after When emotions become supercharged as a family approaches the divorce, worst case scenario, it can be a battle between people. I'm going to not let my spouse take everything from me. They're not going to take my children. I'm going to fight like hell. This is why I encourage you to stay reasonable, to tune down the emotions and tune into how do we best navigate this next phase in both of our lives so we can set ourselves both up for success and we can take care of our most important asset, which is our children. But when emotion gets in the way of that, here's the temptation. I'm going after this. I'm going to get an attorney. He's threatening my children. She's threatening my children. She's threatening to take everything away from me that I've worked so hard for. He's threatening to take everything away from me that I've worked so hard for. And the inclination is I'm going to sit down with an attorney and I'm going to have a consultation and I'm going to fight. And while again, there are very honorable divorce attorneys in the world, realize how they make their money. They make their money by giving you good advice, 
but they make their money in hourly legal fees. So let's talk about the average hourly legal fee. It happens to be $270 per hour on average across the United States. However, some divorce attorneys are as high as $500 per hour. So that thought may be in you or your spouse's head like, I'm not just going to get an average attorney. I'm going to pay to get the best. I want to go back to the fact that the court has guidelines. The court has guidelines for what's in the best interest of the children. They have worksheets they use that they look at the assets of the family. And their goal is to create equal lifestyles for the two spouses as they separate. So let's take an example. Say you were making husband or wife, whatever, you're making $100,000 a year, your spouse is making $20,000 a year. They're going to level down your income from $100,000, they're going to level up your spouse's from $20,000, and they're going to meet in the middle, which I think is $60,000. So from a support perspective, when we think about alimony paid by either spouse, it is to equal the households, pure and simple, unless there's reason not to do so. It is to equal the households. Now realize as well, and I'll speak from experience in California. Other states may differ, although I'm not aware of it. There is what is called a short cause and a long cause marriage. A short cause marriage in the state of California is anything under 10 years. And alimony is paid for half the term of that marriage. So you're married nine years. That means four and a half years of alimony, pure and simple, based on guidelines. This, again, is a spreadsheet question um, for family court. If your marriage exceeds 10 years, it's called long cause. And alimony is paid for the balance of the life. Now let's talk about motivations in this equation. Let's say again you're earning a hundred thousand, your spouse is earning twenty thousand, then you enter into family court and it's equalized at sixty thousand. If that spouse then takes a job and begins to earn over sixty thousand, you can go back to court and adjust that alimony figure. However, if your spouse becomes devious, they can work under the table, they can work for cash, or they can simply not work at all and just live and adjust their lifestyle based on that income. Now this is a smaller circumstance. Let's say you're earning 300,000 per year and you have a stay-at-home spouse who maybe had a part-time job and earned 20,000. Yeah, you can do the math. So again, this is not about the money. I wanna center back on what's in the best interest of the children, but being able to financially care for those children being able not to suffer the financial stress of a divorce in order to really be there and be present is important. So it's important you know that these guidelines exist, right? So let's get back to that initial hearing. And the intent of the initial hearing, as I mentioned, is for the court to get an understanding of your circumstances and situations. And they will, at the end of hearing from both sides, they will make a less than temporary order. And I'll define what that means in a few moments. You may retain an attorney that is going to charge you, you know, $270 an hour. In order to prep for that um, initial meeting, you're going to pay a retainer, which is very standard, $2,000, $4,000, whatever that number is. But this is what I want you to know. And before I tell you this, I want to emphasize the importance of Having a good attorney, whatever that fee is, if you're entering into divorce, if your spouse has an attorney, you probably should have one as well. They will give you sound advice. They will lay a foundation for expectations. Most importantly, you will learn from observing them how the family court system works. And we're going to come back to that point in a few minutes. But once you've retained an attorney, they're going to do consultations with you. It's important that you know that attorneys bill in 15 minute increments. So let's take that $270 and let's divide that by four. That means every 15 minutes, there's a bill of $67.50. 
They're going to be prepping for the call prior, which you're going to pay for. During that phone conversation where you're getting ready for that initial meeting, you're going to be paying not on the 15 minutes, but every eight minutes, that bills into the next 15 minutes. And a, an attorney who is in it to, in, let's just say, enhance their legal fees, will keep you talking. And if you watch your clock, they can keep you talking <laughs> for eight minutes. And then if there's still things to talk about, they're going to go past that 15-minute mark into 23. And if they can get past 23, so it is up to your discretion how important that conversation is and how long that conversation lasts. Be aware that some attorneys who have to make a living may play the time clock game. And I'm not suggesting they all do, they most do, or even any do. But what I want you to be aware of is watch that clock and make sure the initial conversations are meaningful and don't let them drag on beyond where they need to because every eight minutes you're ticking off $67.50 or more in legal fees, right? So get the advice you need. Get it as condensed as you can. Be, you know, diplomatic about how you state this, but just say, listen, I want to be careful about my assets, so let's really get succinct about what we need to talk about today because if you don't, it can spin wildly out of control. Know this, every court document that's prepared by an attorney is subject to that same billing, that same 15-minute, 8-minute rule. Every phone conversation they have with opposing counsel is subject to that same 8-minute, 15-minute rule. Every letter that's written back and forth between attorneys and legal counsel is also subject to that 8-minute, 15-minute rule. So you can begin to see in a contentious divorce where there's a ton of back and forth, you know, your attorney's going to call you and say, I just got a letter from opposing counsel and they're accusing you of X, Y, Z, or they're stating you're hiding money in X, Y, Z manner, and we need to do something about this and respond. And then you're going to have to talk through how that response should look, and that attorney's going to have to draft a letter responding to those likely false accusations. doesn't matter if they're false or true. Again, remember, perjury is not a thing in family court for the most part, unless it's egregious and obvious. It's not a thing that gets pursued in family court. <laughs> so... Every accusation that spouse makes to try to, you know, build a basis behind why they're taking the actions that they do requires a response from your retained attorney, which means they're going to have to talk to you, which means they're going to have to draft a court response and or a court letter, which means they're going to have to prepare for that call. And the eight minutes and 15 minutes build and build and build and can get well beyond our control far more quickly than we expect. Let's get back to the initial hearing. So again, this is about the court understanding your initial case. This is where things are going to be presented. On your behalf, opposing counsel on your soon-to-be former spouse's behalf. All those things I just talked about are the build-up to that initial, um, whatever it may be, um, <laughs> whatever very temporary decision may be made as a result of that. Let's call it a, um, you know, it's, it's an initial meeting. So, past this meeting is really where I want to raise awareness. And hopefully in this episode, I know it's been a long one, hopefully there have been some things that you have learned that have opened up your eyes to how to approach a contentious marriage how to maybe protect yourself from what can be devastating when you enter into the family court system. The risks of false accusations and how they add up to time, money, and emotional damage. How to focus in on the best interest of your children. Early on, likely you're going to see the signs that divorce may be on the horizon. And the mitigating steps that you take Maybe the marital separation agreement you can negotiate, even bring in a mediator to negotiate so that you protect your family's assets, the mental, emotional health of your children, and frankly yourself and your financial future. 
every step, step you can take in that direction is a critical step. Assuming you don't, and a case is filed in family court, we've talked about the initial consultations. We've talked about how attorneys bill through this process. And again, I'm not discounting the importance of a good attorney's advice. In fact, it's critical in the initial phases all the way through when temporary orders are issued. And then I want to talk about what can potentially come next. But as a final statement, I want you to realize that for that initial meeting, from the time your attorney leaves their office, drives to court, and then appears in front of a judge and talks to you afterwards, that is all billable. I also want you to be aware that while you are required to appear, let's say, at 8 a.m., that session will run from 8 o'clock until noon or 8 o'clock until 1 o'clock. Whenever that judge takes their break, you are, you are being required to appear during a time frame and not at a specific time. So you and your attorney, who's billing you for the time from when they left the office to when they got to that hearing, may sit there from 8 o'clock until noon waiting for your case to be heard, which could be heard at 11.45 and could be as brief as, I've read your statements, we want to set up a um, you know, temporary hearing, um, temporary orders hearing, and we're going to do that on X dates. Any dissension, any dissension, okay, boom. It might be a five-minute event in front of the judge that you have been billed four hours for. And I again want to emphasize it's important to have an attorney in the early phases of your divorce. It's your discretion how far into that divorce, if it becomes protracted, that it's important for you to retain legal services. But I think it's absolutely critical, especially if your spouse has an attorney, that you have an attorney as well. The only purpose for me sharing all these things is just to make you aware of the costs associated with this battle you have entered into. So this is part one of an ongoing series, and I will share stories. I may use the I statement in these stories, but these stories will be pulled from the countless numbers of people over the past many, many years decade and a half plus, who've reached out to me and just said, hey, I need your advice. Looks like my family and I are going through a divorce. I may share some of those stories. I will not use names. I will use the I statement. That doesn't mean it's my personal experience. I'm doing this because I want to de-identify names. I don't want to bring up family situations specific to families because I don't want to hurt the people involved, the innocent bystanders in this situation. But I may bring in some stories to help you understand what's really happening in the family court system and how to best help the family court system help you to accomplish the most important thing, which is being able to provide for your loved ones, being able to successfully start your new life, and if there are children involved, to be able to act in the best interest of those children in all ways. So, I want to thank you for joining me for this first of potentially many episodes on Divorce Wars. My name is Philip Macko. I'm the host of the Muddy Waters podcast and YouTube series. I would invite you, if you haven't done so already, to subscribe to this podcast and YouTube for future episode alerts. If you got something from this episode, and I hope you did, please click the like button. It helps with the algorithmic odds in YouTube. It helps more people who may benefit from learning about family court system and divorce strategies and all those other things. It may help many families if they can get exposed to this information. Again, I am not an attorney. This is not legal advice. This is experiential and awareness raising and purpose. I hope you got something from it. I hope that you and your family aren't going through the potential separation and divorce. If so, my heart goes out to you. I just want you to understand the realities of what you're stepping into. So have a blessed day. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you perhaps on the next episode. Thanks so much.